Welcome to ECE 203. This is a lecture on how to build voltage, current, and timing references, ideally those that can operate at very low power. Uh, there's a few different sources uh, that I'm going to pull material from, uh, in particular the Carasoni, Johns, and Martin book. Uh, chapter 7 is a good uh, resource uh, if you're interested. There's also some material from some other textbooks and, and some papers actually from, from the research group here at UCSD uh, that we're also going to pull material from. So the basic idea here is if, if we're gonna go and build a, an entire system, a wearable, implantable, some sort of medical device system, there's a lot of other blocks that need to come into the picture here. Um, and the question is, how do we build these? You know, we've talked about how to build the amplifiers. We've talked a little bit about how to build the analog to digital converters and the digital circuits and so on. Most of these require some bias voltages, some bias currents. Um, they re some of them require a clock and so on. So how do we build these, right? How do, can't we just use a benchtop function generator? Well, no, um, if you want your patient to you know, wear this thing or be implanted, obviously you can't just use a benchtop generator. Uh, you can't use an ideal source and cadence, right? You need to actually build a circuit that's going to build all of these, the, the, do all of these things for you. And that's really the job of today's lecture. We could spend a lot of time, many lectures, talking about how to do all of these uh, circuit design uh, blocks in, in great detail. Uh, but as usual, we're just going to go over um, some of the basic principles and, and go over a few representative circuits that might be uh, useful for, for you. So let's talk about the first class of circuits, uh, and these are known as voltage reference generators or VRGs. The idea with a voltage reference generator is we want to generate a known good voltage for which we can use to bias circuits or you know whatever it is that we need a bias voltage or reference voltage for. Normally, these sort of reference voltages should be independent of PVT variation, meaning process variation. So, you know, due to um, the manufacturing process, the width and lengths of our transistors won't be perfectly exactly what we say. You know, if we're looking for a 180 nanometer length transistor, it could be 185 nanometer or 173.2 nanometers. You know, it's never going to be perfect the threshold voltage of our devices and so on, these are all going to have process variation. So we would like to have some robustness uh, to these uh, voltage reference generators, even if there is process variation that happens. The second letter in PVT is voltage or specifically supply voltage. Uh, okay, so when we build a system, we normally have some supply voltage, let's say it's one volt, but it's never going to be exactly one volt. It'll be one volt plus some ripple from the DC-DC converter. Maybe the battery voltage will be drooping. Um, maybe uh, we want to do voltage scaling and we want to operate over a wide range of voltages and so on. So ideally our voltage reference generator should generate a reference voltage that is independent of whatever supply voltage we throw at the circuit. And the last letter stands for temperature. We want to make sure that our supply voltage, or sorry, our reference voltage is independent of temperature ideally. Okay. Now, I should mention that a reference voltage is usually something that is totally PVT independent or as PVT independent as possible, but that might be different than a bias voltage. Sometimes we want to generate a bias voltage that does change with, for example, temperature such that some other property in the circuit might be constant with temperature, for example, transconductance, something like this. So um, a reference voltage is something that's generally thought to be independent of PVT, and a bias voltage may or not, may not share that same characteristic. So let's talk about the simplest possible way we could build a voltage reference generator. Um, it won't be one that satisfies PVT variation, but let's just take a look. Let's imagine we have some supply voltage VDD and we need to bias a transistor or something like this and we want the bias voltage to be less than VDD. So we can't just go to our lab bench top and you know, use a voltage generator to generate this voltage. We need to do so on the chip if this is going to be a wearable or implantable system. So the very simplest way that we could do this is we just build a resistive divider. Right. Um, the reference voltage in this case, VREF, 
will be equal to R2 over R1 plus R2 times VDD. Right? So we can configure the ratio between R1 and R2, and that will generate us a you know, configurable reference voltage. So this certainly works fine, um, but there's some major downsides, as you can imagine. First of all, a little sad face here, this is very, it's linearly supply dependent. So if the supply voltage VDD changes, well, your reference voltage is going to change. So we are definitely not V uh, independent in the PVT um, letters. In addition, the accuracy of this depends, the accuracy depends on resistor matching. Uh, which is generally not well controlled in on-chip applications. Resistors don't tend to match too well uh, on chip. Okay, in addition, this circuit you know consumes static you know a lot potentially of static bias current, depending on the size of those resistors. So we are not um, supply independent. We're not process independent. Depending on the nature of those resistors, we may be temperature independent, but if the resistors themselves have temperature coefficients or temperature dependency, then we won't be temperature uh, independent either. Okay, so the, it was our first start, uh, but doesn't get us nearly the way there. Okay, so let's try and uh, change this just a little bit. Um, instead of having R2 as a resistor, let's replace it with a diode connected MOSFET. Okay, so for the moment, let's imagine this was in above threshold. And if it's in above threshold, then we can say that the drain current of this transistor, which is equal to VDD minus VREF over R, is given by 1 half mu N C ox W over L times VREF, I'm gonna run out of space here, minus VT all squared. Okay, so the, 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 the term on the left is just the voltage drop across the resistor and the term on the right is the normal above threshold transistor formula. So you'll note here VREF is on both sides of the equation. Um, it's a quadratic equation. We can go ahead and solve for VREF. Okay, and if we go ahead and do so, we get the following answer. It's VT plus a bunch of junk. Okay, so let's write this down. It's two times VDD minus VT times mu N C ox W over L times R plus one. All of this is minus one divided by mu N C ox W over L times R. Okay, so nominally VREF is equal to the threshold voltage plus all this junk. Um, in this junk, we have uh, mu n, this is mobility. Mobility has some temperature dependencies. Uh, w over L is in here. Um, those obviously have some process dependencies. VDD is in here, uh, but at least VDD is in the square root function, right? So before it was linear, now it's a square root function. So we can say this is, uh, I guess, somewhat independent. of VDD. Okay, still very much dependent on process variation and temperature. And frankly, we're not really that independent of VDD, but it's certainly better uh, than our first try, which was just that resistive divider. So that idea of using a diode connected MOSFET was actually a pretty good idea. We got some degree of um, independence from VDD by, by doing that, although it wasn't a very strong independence. But the, the problem with that circuit is that the voltage of the, of the diode, of this diode connected transistor, you know, it depends on the resistance uh, that's connected to VDD and so on. And, and so as a result, we don't get good uh, supply voltage independence because the current that flows through that resistor will obviously depend on VDD.
So one, we, one way we can help address this problem is through a technique called self-biasing. Okay, and the idea here is we want to use a diode or a diode connected transistor, and we want the current through the diode to depend on the voltage of the diode itself, not on VDD. Okay, so bear with me to, to, to see how this particular feedback circuit works. So if this is a high gain op amp, both the positive and the negative terminals of the uh, circuit must be equal to the diode drop voltage VD. That means that this voltage across R1, or sorry, let me just annotate this here. This voltage must be VD and this voltage also must be VD, which means that the voltage across R1 is VD. Okay, if the voltage across R1 is VD, then we know the current fl flowing through R1 is just equal to VD over R1, okay? Uh, this current can't go into the input of the op amp, so this current must flow this, this way over here. So what we can say is that the output voltage, we'll call VO, is equal to VD, the voltage drop across R1, plus the voltage drop across R2, which is just VD over R1, that's the current flowing through the branch, times R2. Okay, so that's what the output voltage is equal to. This is, if we gather terms, equal to VD plus uh, times 1 plus R2 over R1. Okay, so we know what the output voltage is. Uh, therefore, we also know what the current across this resistor must be equal to, uh, which also happens to be the current flowing through the diode. ID is just equal to VO minus VD uh, over R. All right, that's the voltage drop across the resistor R, which is equal to VD times R2 over R1 over R. Okay, and so as you'll note here, the diode current does not depend on VDD. There's no VDD term in here. Okay, so that's beneficial. We're biasing a diode with some current whose current is independent of VDD. All right, so this is great. Um, this gets us you know, part of the way there. Now, I should note that you do have to be careful about startup conditions. There's two states that are stable uh, in this in the system. One is when the current is flowing, as, as we just described here. Uh, there's another stable state where there's just no current at all in the circuit. Um, and that in that case, we don't have a good uh, bias voltage. So we do need to be careful about that when we're designing a circuit like this. So we really like this concept of self-biasing a diode because then we get some degree of uh, independence from, from VDD, but we don't like having this, this op amp and we have to rely on the ratio of resistors and so on. So uh, at least to simplify things a little bit, let's go ahead and make um, a similar kind of circuit, but getting rid of that op amp, okay? So if you take a look at this circuit, it looks a little confusing, but, but bear with me for a moment. These two PMOS devices uh, on top here are arranged such that their VSGs are the same. And if they're the same size, that means the current flowing through them, I, must by definition be exactly the same. This current, there's only, if you ignore the startup network, it can only flow down this way over here. So that means that the current flow flowing through those NMOS devices must also be the same. Okay, so we can say here is that VGS1 must be equal to VGS2 on this side over here. Okay, so if that's the case, the only way that this can happen is that if the voltage drop across this resistor R is equal to VD, or the diode voltage. Okay, so in that case, the current can be easily described as the diode voltage divided by R. Okay, so just like in that version of the op amp circuit, the um, voltage uh, across the diode um, or rather the diode is being provided its own bias current that is uh, independent of the uh, supply voltage. There's no VDD dependence here. So this is basically a very similar outcome to what we had in the previous slide. But um, these, these sort of circuits still depend on process parameters, the accuracy of the resistor and so on. We'd like to do better and that brings us to our next circuit. So this brings us to the design of what we call a band gap reference or a BGR. Uh, 
Okay, this is a very popular circuit that exists basically in almost any circuit, integrated circuit that uh, uses analog circuits. Okay, so when you're generating bias currents and so on, most of it is referenced with respect to a band gap reference. And the main idea here is it's really hard to have anything in a CMOS process that is totally independent of temperature. Resistors have temperature coefficients, transistors have temperature dependencies, and so on. So the idea is to say, well, forget about trying to think, make something that is independent of temperature. Why don't we make one thing that is proportional to absolute temperature, or PTAT, and something that is complementary to absolute temperature, or CTAT, and set the slopes of these two sources such that they exactly cancel out and the net thing that we're generating is totally independent of temperature. Okay, that's the basic idea behind a band gap reference generator. So how these are typically constructed is, is from the following circuit. We have a diode connected BJT transistor whose current, uh, if we just describe this here, whose collector current is equal to IS times E to the VBE, the base emitter uh, voltage divided by phi T basically just looks like a subthreshold transistor, except there's no N parameter. So in this case, if we can solve for VBE, the base emitter voltage, um, and you know, spread out some terms and so on, we get VG0 times one minus T over T naught plus VBE naught times T over T naught plus M phi T times the natural log of T naught over T plus phi T times JC over JC naught. Okay, so what's uh, going on here? T naught is the reference temperature. VG naught is the band gap voltage. of silicon at zero Kelvin, uh, which is equal to 1.206 volts. And J, C naught, J is, is typically what we use to represent current density. So J, C naught is the current density at temperature T naught, the reference temperature. Okay, so um, all of these terms are just kind of uh, pulled out from some of the semiconductor physics. Basically what this means is that the, the baseline voltage here is proportional to the band gap voltage. Um, and, and then there's uh, some temperature uh, coefficients that go on top of all of this. Okay. So this is how we would generate what we would call our CTAT reference source. Okay. This voltage is complementary to absolute temperature. And so the next thing we have to consider is, well, how are we going to generate a PTAT reference? And then how are we going to add it to this voltage reference to create something that's ideally independent of absolute temperature and independent of process variation and supply voltage variation? So the first thing to, to note here is that um, we can do this in a normal CMOS process, despite the fact that there's a bipolar transistor there. Uh, we can make parasitic BJTs uh, just by making sure that we arrange our uh, doped uh, and implant layers uh, appropriately, right? So an NPN transistor is possible or a PNP transistor is possible, depending on if we're in, in an N well uh, or in a P well that's surrounded by a, a deep N well, for example. Um, so it is possible to generate um, or to create BJTs in a CMOS process, even if there's not normally uh, a BJT is available. So how are we going to generate this um, PTAT voltage? Well, one way to do it is to take two BJTs and bias them at different current densities. Okay, so let's just go through a simple example. Let's take this one uh, BJT here and let's bias it with M times I naught worth of current. And then let's bias another, oops, no arrow there, another BJT, like so. And let's bias this just at I naught. Okay, we'll call this BJT Q1, 
and this BJTQ2. And what we're interested in is the difference between the VBE voltages here, delta VBE. Now, because these are diode connected, um, these are really the, the, the base emitter voltages of these BJT transistors. So we can say that delta VBE is just equal to, well, it's VBE1 minus VBE2, okay? So we can derive what VBE1 and 2 are. It's uh, phi t times the natural log, in this case, of m i naught over i s 1 minus phi t times the natural log of i naught over i s 2, okay? Which is equal to phi t times, uh, you know, these sort of things uh, cancel out, assuming that um, IS1 is equal to IS2. This is equal to phi t times the natural log of M. Okay. Phi t, as you recall, is kt over q times the natural log of M. M is just an integer. So here we are we have something that is linear proportional to temperature, kT over Q. T stands for temperature, as you recall. So this is a PTAT source, okay? Now, you might think this is a little bit of a strange way to build a PTAT, um, but you'll see in the next slide, hopefully, that this does uh, indeed uh, becomes a useful structure for us. So the basic idea to generate our first version of a bandgap reference voltage, voltage generator is to basically combine those two ideas we just discussed. We'll combine this, um, uh, th this uh, current through a BJT to generate a CTAT voltage with the difference in base emitter voltages through a pair of BJTs to create our PTAT voltage. And we would do this in a very clever circuit uh, called a Brokaw cell. Okay, so uh, first of all, you'll note here that we have uh, a current source or a current mirror uh, through these BJTs uh, at the top here. These are the same size, and so as a result, we get the same current flowing through both of these branches here. Okay, now this is where the magic comes in. We have the same current flowing through these two branches, but what we're going to do here is we're going to say that the the lower two BJTs. Q2 is going to be m times larger than Q1. Okay, so they have the same current, but Q2 is m times larger. As a result, the current density through uh, Q2 is m times uh, the current density through um, m1, even though IC1 is equal to IC2. Okay, so the current is the same, but the current density is different. Uh, and let me just make uh, one more note, maybe somewhere over here. Uh, so we'll note that IC is equal to AE times JC, where AE is the area of the base emitter junction. Okay, so then what we can say is um, we have a different current density flowing through these two transistors, although the currents are the same. We can find the voltage across resistor R2. VR2, actually what we can do here is we can just do a little Kirchhoff's voltage loop. It's equal to VBE2, if we go up across the terminals of, of Q2, minus VBE1. Hey, wouldn't you know? This is equal to delta VBE. That's great, okay? We just derived on the previous slide that this is going to be PTAT. It's gonna be equal to KT over Q times the natural log of M. Okay, so this is our PTAT source, delta VBE. And it just happens to be integrated right into the circuit. So if we know R2, or sorry, the voltage across R2, and we know R2, then we know the current through R2 this is just equal to delta VBE divided by R2. This current is still PTAT, uh, so long as R2 doesn't have any uh, obvious temperature coefficient. And now we can figure out the volt, or sorry, the current through R1, 
which must be equal to 2 times the current through R2. Remember, since IC1 is equal to IC2, uh, and then the two branches just combine before they hit resistor R1. So this means that VR1 is equal to IR1 times R1, which is equal to 2 times delta VBE times R1 over R2. Okay, so now we have enough information to create the our output voltage. V out is equal to VR1 plus delta VBE plus VBE. Right, that's just a Kirchhoff voltage loop to get um, all the way to V out. Um, so this, if we expand this, is equal to delta VBE times 1 plus 2R1 over R2 plus VBE. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. Delta VBE is, as we said, it's PTAT. VBE is CTAT, as we described a few slides ago. Uh, but they may not have the same slope between them. And so we have this term here, which we can use to set the slope and make sure that as temperature varies, these uh, delta VBE and VBE, once delta VBE is, is multiplied by the slope, will precisely cancel out such that we have zero temperature coefficient here. Okay, so this is the very basics of how we would generate a band gap voltage reference. So that Brokaw cell is a, you know, a very established circuit. Uh, we use it all the time, uh, except that some of those BJTs are not so easy or implementable in a standard bulk CMOS process. So for that reason, we tend, to, when we build a band gap reference um, in a bulk CMOS process, we tend to use a circuit that looks something like this. It's conceptually very similar, but uh, just slightly different. So again, what we do here is we set up this uh, current mirror at the top through these PMOS transistors that establish the currents through both branches. Okay, so we'll call this branch here IM1 and this branch IM2. Okay, and we say IM1 is equal to IM2. Uh, these uh, PMOS transistors are enforcing, and fr frankly, the NMOS transistors as, uh, uh, as well are sorry, just the PMOS transistors are enforcing this um, condition. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a KVL analysis. So we're going to do here, these are NPN transistors. And by the way, the reason we like to implement these sort of BJT transistors is because they're, sorry, not NPN, they're PNP transistors, because the P terminal in this case uh, can be ground, uh, which is convenient uh, in a bulk CMOS process because our P substrate is nominally biased to ground. So we can say here that the VBE, we'll call this VBE2 across a transistor Q2, uh, and VBE1 across transistor Q1. We're going to do a KVL around this 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 loop here. So we're going to we're going to take the um, emitter current times R2 plus VBE2 minus the emitter uh, the base emitter voltage R uh, across transistor M1 minus the voltage drop across resistor R1 and set that equal to zero. So that's just some simple uh, KVL analysis. And through this analysis, we can solve for the current flowing through either branch, which is going to be equal to delta VBE divided by R2 minus R1. Okay, so then what we can say is V out is equal to VBE2 plus VR2, right? Because uh, the base here is grounded. Um, and so we just have to take the voltage across uh, VBE plus the voltage across the resistor R2, and that gets us our output voltage. So this is equal to VBE2 plus IE times R2, 
which again is equal to VBE2, plus IE, as we derived earlier, is equal to delta VBE divided by R2 minus R1. Okay, so again, here we get our CTAT, and here we get our PTAT, where the slope is configurable based on the ratio between resistors R1 and R2. And again, I should mention that Q2 is M size larger than uh, Q1, so despite them having the same current, we can say that JC2 is equal to M times JC1. Okay, so this is a very good circuit uh, It's implemented all the time uh, in analog ICs uh, in CMOS technologies. And this gives us an output voltage that is very well controlled uh, across um, process variation, although we still have to a little bit of R1 and R2 matching issues here. Uh, but in general, this is pretty good against process variation, uh, ideally independent of VDD, so long as the circuits remain in saturation. Um, and uh, also, uh, if as long as you get the slopes correct, independent of temperature. So there's one downside of the circuit that I just showed. Uh, it, it is a very good circuit. It's used all the time. But its output voltage is based on the band gap of silicon, and it effectively gives us an output voltage on the order of about 1.25 volts or so. That means, you know, we have a fairly high stack of transistors. We have one BJT, a resistor, and then two transistors stacked on top of this. In order to make sure these transistors remain in saturation, we typically require a supply voltage of at least 1.5 volts, typically higher. Okay. Now, a lot of our low power systems don't want to be operating on a supply voltage that high because, well, power is equal to voltage times current. If we have high voltage, we're going to have high power. So intrinsically, that kind of band gap reference generator doesn't work well, or, or doesn't work period, with a low voltage design. Okay, so what do we do if we want to build something that can work at lower voltages? Well, we don't have to use a band gap reference structure. We could do something else, and that's certainly possible. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But the main reason why that particular band gap reference voltage generator needed a high supply voltage is because we are adding voltages, right? We're adding this VBE plus delta VBE on top of our bias conditions and, and so on and so forth. Why don't we add currents instead? If we can add currents, then we don't need all of this extra voltage headroom, and maybe things will uh, work out nicely. Okay, so this is an example circuit that uh, might end up working well. Okay, so let, let's go ahead and, and analyze this. So first of all, we have one diode or diode connected MOSFET over here. We'll call this VBE1, or it could be a bipolar transistor, of course, as well. And on the other side, we have N times these um, uh, in, in this configuration. Okay, so this terminal here we're going to call VBE1. Uh, this voltage drop across this resistor RB is called, I'm going to call it VRB. And then we'll call this node here VBE2. Uh, sorry, uh, this node is VBE1. And that's just due to the uh, feedback nature of the op amp in order to create the circuit, uh, maintain the circuit stability. So in this particular case, we're going to say that we have an M to one ratio of, of sizing uh, in, the, in, the, in these circuits. And as a result, in this case, uh, the current actually will be different. OK, so we say that the, the voltage drop across resistor RB is just going to be equal to VBE one minus VBE two, right? Because VBE one is on the top and VBE two, I guess I could draw this here, VBE two is on the bottom of that resistor. So the voltage drop across RB is equal to delta VBE, which again is equal to KT over Q times the natural log in this case of M times N, right? Because we have N times larger uh, diodes and we have this factor of M difference in current. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to now convert VBE 
1 and delta VBE into current. So we can sum these in the current domain. Okay, so we do this um, through the following process. I2A in this case is taking VBE1, VBE1, and just dividing it by resistor RA. Okay, so this will be CTAT. Okay. On the other hand, I2B uh, is equal to delta VBE divided by RB. Okay, so this is PTAT. And wouldn't you know it, these two currents sum. Okay, they sum into transistor Q2 uh, to create current I2, which is just I2A plus I2B. So we say this is constant with temperature. So now we have a current that is constant with temperature. We mirror it over. That creates um, and, and drop it across a um, resistor here, and we mirror it over with a 1 to K ratio. So we say that V ref is equal to K times I2 times R, which uh, should ideally be temperature independent, uh, provided we got our slopes correct and, and so on. So what's nice about this particular circuit is we only have our diodes and a single transistor instead of two transistors. Uh, so we could potentially operate this at lower voltages than uh, we could with the, the prior band gap reference voltage generator that I showed earlier. One of the other challenges we have with band gap reference generators is that a lot of them consume fairly high power. We're, we're talking about microwatts of power. Um, which you know may not sound like a whole lot to you, but there are systems that we are interested in building whose entire power budgets are on the nanowatt regime. Uh, this could be a very small implant or a small IoT device or something like this. And if your bias generator consumes microwatts, then what's the point of designing the rest of your circuit to consume nanoamps? Now, if you're very careful about your band gap reference generators, you can get them down to, you know, kind of the, maybe the 10 nanowatt range, something like this. But it's still very difficult, even with the structure in the previous slide, to do it at low supply voltages. So sometimes we do require lower power and operation at even lower supply voltages. Let's say, for example, 0 0.5 volts from the output of an energy harvester. So there are other ways, non-band gap reference generator ways, in order to generate uh, voltage references. Let's take this circuit as an example. Let's take a regular NMOS transistor and we'll connect it such that VGS is equal to zero for this particular transistor, and then stack it on top of a PMOS transistor that is connected in uh, the diode configuration. Uh, but you know the current is flowing in from the top rather than through the bottom. So if both transistors are appropriately sized such that the currents in this structure are small, they will operate in the subthreshold regime. And one current uh, through, through the NMOS will be equal to the current through the PMOS, provided that the reference voltage is not drawing any current. So if they're in subthreshold, we can go ahead and equate the currents and derive an expression for the output voltage, V ref, in this particular case. Uh, and that's shown right here. So what you'll note here is that VREF is dependent on some ratios and the difference between threshold voltages and so on. How does this depend on temperature? Well, it turns out that we can take the derivative of this expression with respect to temperature and equate it to zero. And if we do so, we find that there is a solution where the derivative of the reference voltage with respect to temperature is zero for a particular ratio of, of of sizing between these two transistors. So if you size the W over L ratios of these two transistors uh, in the following manner, according to the equation in green here, then ideally, at least to first order, we should get no temperature um, coefficient to this output reference voltage. In addition, you'll find that this output reference voltage shouldn't ideally depend on VDD. So this overall concept uh, was uh, first suggested by some researchers at the University of Michigan, 
uh, they used a native uh, FET um, stacked on top of uh, a high threshold voltage IO um, and FET um, and were able to get some pretty remarkable results actually. They implemented this in a few different process technologies. They show the W over L ratios up there and they showed that hey you know what between minus 20 degrees Celsius and plus 80 degrees Celsius we're getting a temperature coefficient on the order of you know less than about 20 ppm per degree Celsius. So that's actually pretty decent uh, for a reference voltage. You can see here across this temperature variation, the absolute voltage of the circuit varies by, you know, maybe a fraction of a single digit millivolt. Okay, that's great. Um, now, it turns out that th the structure on its own is somewhat PVT independent. Um, but there's a few challenges. Uh, it, it does have some supply voltage dependency. Um, it doesn't show up in the first order equations, but uh, Dibble and you know other things uh, do end up mattering here. And so one thing that, that we thought might be interesting is why don't we take the output of one of these voltage reference generators and use it to regulate as a supply voltage for another voltage reference generator, okay? So we called the original one a, a, a 2T or a two transistor voltage reference generator. And we create a 4T uh, voltage reference generator, which takes the output of one as the su supply voltage to the other. And as long as you size your transistors correctly, such that the output of the first one is large enough to act as the supply voltage for the second one, this sort of thing can uh, very much uh, improve the ability to regulate a, a good reference voltage at the output with, with, with significantly less uh, supply voltage variation. So here we're plotting the absolute supply voltage versus the normalized output voltage. And you can see here by doing this 4T structure, we definitely get uh, an improvement. So, however, one of the challenges with these kind of structures is that although the, app, uh, although the relative voltage of these structures is pretty good with respect to temperature, if you've sized your transistors correctly, fairly decent with respect to voltage, um, there does exist process variation in the sense that the absolute voltage that you get will depend on process variation. So in this particular case, you could get 175 millivolts. On another chip, you could get 196 millivolts. You know, it, it could have some variation with process. And that may or may not be a problem depending on your uh, particular circuit and the application you're designing for. Maybe you do need a very specific uh, predefined voltage that you're trying to bias for, uh, or maybe it doesn't matter the precise voltage uh, as long as it's stable with respect to temperature. So now that we have a nice voltage reference generator, let's talk about how we might generate a current reference, right? Let's say we want to bias our op amps with a certain amount of current. We want that current to be 10 microamps or one microamp or whatever. You want to know that that's going to be accurate uh, after you fabricate your chip. So it turns out if you have a stable voltage reference generator, it's actually very easy to generate a constant with temperature current. All you have to do is apply that voltage across a resistor that will generate a current. If the resistor is constant with temperature, which you can make resistors that have fairly good constant with temperature properties, then you get a current that is constant with temperature. Okay, so that's, that's really all it takes. So in this case, this resistor should be constant with temperature. And if you're designing in a, in a PDK and, and you don't know, then it, the PDK documents should tell you the temperature coefficients of each all of the different resistor options uh, that you have available to you in the PDK. Um, or you could just run simulations. Um, chances are there, well, there may or may not have a resistor that is totally constant with temperature. So what you can do is you can take a resistor that is PTAT and a resistor that's CTAT, put them in series or put them in parallel um, and uh, you know cancel out their temperature coefficients. So anyways, the idea here is you take your reference voltage through the feedback of the op amp, VREF gets applied right here. Uh, that gets uh, applied across that resistor and then mirrored up through the current mirror. So our reference current is equal to M times VREF divided by R. Uh, 
Okay, and if R is, is constant with temperature and if V ref is constant with temperature, then uh, this should be a constant with te temperature uh, current. So one question you may ask yourself is, well, what about noise? Uh, what happens if there's noise that's generated here? Um, and the answer is, you know, look, this is a reference generator. It's supposed to be DC. If you don't have to duty cycle it, then just filter the crap out of it. Okay, put a nice big capacitor here, maybe a nice big capacitor here, you know, filter it um, so that its effective bandwidth is extremely small. As we know uh, in our analysis of noise, noise is proportional to bandwidth. So if we have this at, you know, one hertz bandwidth or less or something like this, the amount of noise on this node should be extremely low. So one question we may ask ourselves is, let's say we're operating at a VDD of half a volt, and we want to generate a reference current of 10 picoamps. Okay, well, what size of resistor do we need? Let's imagine that the reference voltage is less than 0.5 volts, naturally. So if the ref is less than 0.5 volts, we can say that the required resistor is equal to, well, VREF over the current, um, this has to be less than 50 giga ohms. Oh boy, okay, so 50 giga ohms is pretty difficult to achieve in a small area. Now, we've had this discussion already about MOS bipolar pseudo resistors and so on, and that was a way that we can generate a very large resistance in a small area. The problem is MOS bipolar pseudo resistors have significant uh, temperature coefficients, the absolute resistance that they achieve is uncertain and so on. So let's look at a different way to do this. One possible way is to use gate leakage. This is something that we've uh, mentioned uh, earlier, uh, basically in a process technology at about the 90 nanometer mark and below, the thickness of the oxides between the gate uh, and the uh, body of the transistor are so thin that there's a non-zero probability of charge carriers just tunneling right through the gate oxide. Uh, this creates gate current or gate leakage. And it just so happens that different transistor types may have different gate leakage parameters. Okay, so in, in a particular process that we were designing in, for example, we had a LVT, a low threshold voltage transistor, and a standard threshold voltage transistor, and they happen to have opposite gate leakage temperature coefficients. So if we can put two gates in, in parallel, and size them such that their temperature coefficients uh, zero out, then what we'll get is some leakage current through these um, uh, gates that is um, extremely low, so effectively a very large gate resistance, but with a temperature coefficient that's pretty darn good, even across process variation. So we went ahead and, and built a, a number of different uh, current reference generators. This is one example where we took our voltage reference generator, uh, which, which is our, our 4T voltage reference generator, 2T here and 2T over here, to generate a reference voltage. This reference voltage gets passed through this um, uh, feedback uh, op amp uh, and into a temperature compensated uh, gate uh, leakage circuit. And then this voltage here just gets mirrored over into this um, current branch over here to generate our reference current. So this was one possible implementation. Again, it's uh, summarized uh, over here. Um, but it turns out that we could be smarter about this. We don't actually need that op amp. We just need some feedback circuit with some gain. Uh, so we can actually do this uh, simply by replacing that op amp with um, an extra transistor that's incorporated into the bias structure. Uh, to create what we call a 5T or 5 transistor current reference generator here. Uh, and this circuit works, uh, you know, fairly well. We actually added an additional transistor here, uh, which is used for some supply voltage regulation purposes. So we went ahead and built this along with all sorts of other uh, current reference generators. Um, here's the measurement results from, from one of these. And you can see here on the top left, the uh, absolute current that we get from these current reference generators is variable. 
so we don't get precisely the right amount of current. We do have fairly significant variation on the absolute current, but, but across temperature and supply voltage variation, we get pretty darn good performance, especially given the fact that the power consumption for this circuit was 3.4 picowatts. That's not a typo. This is not even nanowatts, this is picowatts. Okay, it's literally only five transistors operating in deep subthreshold. This is pretty extraordinarily low power. And in addition, despite us being extremely low power, we still had decent, though not state-of-the-art, uh, temperature coefficient for 69 uh, ppm per degree C. Uh, but at the time that we published this in 2018, uh, you can see here that we were by far the lowest power uh, in operation and in, in fact next to the ones that were even you know two orders of magnitude higher power we actually even had better performance in terms of temperature coefficient uh, than those ones did so there's lots of variations on this there's still a lot of research going on into into these sort of things as well um, but uh, you know there's a lot of fun that can be had so the next thing that I want to discuss is uh, oscillator design, specifically a sleep mode oscillator. So this is some oscillator that's going to have to be on in the system just to keep time on when the system should wake up again. So this is not supposed to be a precision low phase noise oscillator or something like this. It's just supposed to keep accurate time. So as a result, we need it to have low power. In addition, it needs to keep accurate time, even if something like temperature supply voltage, process changes, um, or you know, over a significant length of time, we need all of this to, to fairly stay fairly constant. Um, typically, these sort of sleep mode oscillators range from anywhere from a few hertz uh, for very low power designs to several kilohertz for slightly higher power designs. Uh, 32.768 kilohertz happens to be a very popular frequency for uh, real-time clocks. Uh, you might think that's a strange number, but it turns out that 2 to the 15 clock cycles, which is nice and easy to count with a binary counter, happens to equal to one second uh, at that particular frequency. There are many different types of oscillators uh, that we could build. There are crystal oscillators. These uh, work on the basis of piezoelectric transduction uh, between electric signals and mechanical resonances in a, in a quartz, typically crystal. Now, if you want a good um, frequency reference, a crystal is basically the, the bee's knees, okay? It gives you very stable reference uh, over temperature, supply variation, and so on. Um, but crystals are big. They, you know, if you're building a small implant, you want to think carefully if you need uh, to use a crystal. Uh, they can be costly. I mean, we're only talking about a few cents, but, uh, but in a mass-produced system, that can matter. Uh, but if you want the best phase noise, uh, if you want good stability and, and, and good absolute accuracy, a crystal is extremely good. Uh, in fact, uh, almost all modern um, computing and certainly all, all modern wireless systems use crystal references. But there are other op possibilities. We could do a MEMS oscillator. There's some sort of... Uh, mechanical resonator that can be built. Uh, typically, these are a little smaller than a crystal oscillator, but also typically they operate at higher frequencies than a crystal oscillator. Uh, they tend to require some amount of temperature compensation, either through the electronics or through some other physical means. So when we build a small real-time clock or sleep mode timer, what we typically do is we build an integrated oscillator, uh, usually based on RC time constants. These are very small, very low cost, but their temperature properties, their temperature stability is not nearly as good as something like a crystal. So within the, the category of integrated oscillators, uh, there are multiple different ways to um, build these. We can build an active or linear oscillator that excites a resonance. So this would be, for example, an LC oscillator, something that you might have studied in your RF classes if you took them. These will typically produce a sinusoidal output. And, um, you know, these are, if you're going to build an LC oscillator, these are typically used at, you know, very high frequencies, you know, megahertz to gigahertz, especially when they're integrated. So that's probably not a good solution for us. There's uh, ring oscillators. You know, we've studied these in, in our lectures and, and homeworks on digital. And these are 
conceptually very simple. You just take a bunch of inverters, odd number of inverters, and you connect them in a ring. But the oscillation frequency depends on the inverter delay, depends on the supply voltage very strongly, uh, depends on temperature and so on. So these, unless they're uh, compensated somehow, are not typically used for uh, these kind of sleep mode timers. So typically instead what we do is we build relaxation oscillators. These are nonlinear oscillators um, formed by switching between you know, some sort of relaxation period, typically some sort of ramping voltage or something like this, and a short reset period that disrupts this point. It's typically, as I mentioned, implemented via on-chip RC time constants. So the basic relaxation oscillator is based on the following principle. You take a current source, ideally one that is constant with temperature, and you charge a capacitor. Ideally, the capacitor's capacitance is also constant with temperature. Once the voltage hits a reference voltage, also that is constant with temperature, then we purge the, the charge on the capacitor by shorting it out. Uh, that'll bring the voltage back down to zero, and then we repeat. Okay. If the current source, the capacitor, and the reference voltage is all constant with temperature, then this ideally is, uh, a, generates a sawtooth waveform that has a frequency that is constant with temperature. But of course, that's not possible. Our, our current reference generator will have some temperature dependence. Our voltage reference generator will have some temperature dependence. In fact, now we have to generate two, which kind of seems um, you know, not great. So maybe there's something we could do about that. And indeed there is. If we could generate two reference currents, then it turns out we don't need to generate a reference voltage. We can just take that reference current and pass it across the reference uh, or pass it across a resistor to generate that reference voltage, which is now going to track any variation that might happen in the constant current. Okay, so in this particular case, it turns out that the um, frequency of oscillation is going to be equal to one over two times RC based on the RC time constant here. Even though we're linearly charging a, a capacitor, we're charging it until it hits basically that RT, RC time constant. Now, in this particular case, the power consumption of this circuit is related to the power of the comparator, the power of the current reference generator, and the power required to charge and purge that capacitor. So, it turns out that the oscillation frequency of this circuit uh, depends on many things. Uh, it depends on the delay of the comparator. It depends on the offset of the comparator. And if there's any mismatch between these two current sources, we'll get some um, influence on the ultimate oscillation frequency. So, you know, to first order, we said the oscillation frequency was equal to one over two times RC. But that comparator does have a finite delay. Okay, so we should add it into our oscillation frequency formula. So it turns out that the delay of the comparator can depend on temperature and supply voltage variation. Okay, so as a result, if temperature changes, our oscillation frequency by, by this phenomena will also change. So there's two ways in which we can deal with this. One is we can just make the temperature, or sorry, the uh, delay of the comparator much less than the RC time constant. So for example, if it's 0.1% of the RC time constant, even if it changes with temperature, it's not going to heavily influence the oscillation frequency. Or one thing that we could do is we could say, well, you know what, it does change with temperature. Why don't we use it as part of the compensation uh, on the RC circuit itself. Okay, so let's say we have a PTAT current, could we make the delay CTAT or vice versa? Right, so these are other possibilities, and in fact, they're possibilities that we uh, have published on um, as a way to help compensate. Now, the downside of making the comparator delay very small is that you have to burn current to do this. Okay, so the advantage of trying to use it as a compensator is that, hey, we can actually burn way less current in our comparator 
uh, and intentionally make it PTAT or CTAT uh, and just compensate it throughout the rest of the circuit. Um, now, if you don't do that and you just want to make it small, then normally what you would do is bias it with a, a PTAT current source such that the transconductance, um, which is uh, related um, to the current and you know um, the uh, thermal voltage KT over Q, um, so that the transconductance of the circuit remains constant over temperature. So here's a, a little bit more uh, of, of detail on this oscillation period, including the uh, comparator offset, uh, input referred noise, uh, and so on. Um, so this, as it turns out, the 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 Current source mismatch, sorry, uh, can be is generally st fairly static over temperature and supply voltage. This is basically the W over L ratio is not perfectly matched. That can be removed by a one-time cal calibration. The comparator input referred offset voltage is also something else that can depend with temperature. Okay, which is something that uh, we may have to compensate for. So it turns out that there's a cute trick. Uh, on how to cancel out the comparator offset. And the idea is basically chopping, okay? So in this particular design, on uh, one phase of the clock, what we do is we allow uh, either the positive or the, ter or, or the negative terminal of the branch to uh, have the uh, resistor connected to it instead of the capacitor. And then in the next cycle, we just swap, swip, switch it, okay? Which is basically chopping the input polarity of the signal. So in simulation, at least according to this paper I'm citing here, if the if even if we have a 6% um, offset, this results in a 0.06% frequency change across temperature. So the circuit works in the, in the following manner. On, on one phase of the clock, we're charging up the capacitor. Um, uh, and this is, go, is going in a, in a linear ramp. And uh, through switch S4, we're establishing an IR voltage drop that's acting as the reference into the negative terminal of this comparator. Okay, so the time that we spend um, in this particular state is given by RC, the RC time constant, plus C times the offset voltage over I plus the comparator delay TD. Okay, so if we had no offset voltage, then we wouldn't have to add this uh, additional term. But be because we have an offset voltage, it's going to take a little extra time for us to, to charge and overcome this offset voltage. So on the next phase of the clock, what we do is we swap the polarity here. Okay, um, so we, we in this case, the negative terminal is attached to a charging capacitor. And the positive terminal is attached to the um, uh, to, to, to the current flowing through the resistor, generating that reference voltage. So in this case, the time we spent in phi one is equal to RC. In this case, it's minus C times V offset divided by I plus the comparator delay. So if we add both of these to the period, then we just get the period is equal to two RC plus the comparator delay. I guess plus two comparator delays. Okay, so um, does that, uh, hopefully uh, that makes sense. So in this case, uh, uh, my colleague uh, Arun had implemented this, this chip um, and uh, what he saw that is without chopping the, uh, to, to cancel out the comparator offset, he got a frequency variation of plus or minus 1.8%, which is typically not acceptable. Uh, but when he enabled chopping, then that offset uh, compensation resulted in a frequency variation across temperature of uh, plus or minus 0.25%. So this is uh, extremely good. Now, uh, it also turns out that this chopping technique also happens to help improve the or reduce the flicker noise uh, of the of the op amp uh, and as a result uh, the allen deviation which is a measure of the frequency stability over uh, long averaging periods actually uh, improves uh, 
as you uh, increase the averaging time. So I did mention that ring oscillators are not typically used for these sort of applications, but as it turns out, um, they can be uh, so long as they're compensated, right? So uh, normally if we were to build a ring oscillator, we wouldn't actually make it uh, a, the delay based on the inverters, but rather the delay should be based on an RC time constant. Um, and uh, so one way that we can um, build such a ring oscillator uh, and make it more independent of supply voltage variation is we can uh, self bias uh, you know, a single inverter, uh, use that as a voltage drop uh, through, a, um, through a current source over here, and then through a feedback network, use that to regulate the supply voltage of, a, of, of the inverters here. And so even though we're not trying to make the inverters part of the um, delay of the circuit, in this case, at least the delay that we would get would be constant. Uh, so this is an example implementation here. Again, the delay is largely dependent on the RC time constant here. The C can be changed uh, dynamically if you want to configure it for a different frequency. Uh, but in this case, the inverters are locally regulated such that their um, uh, supply voltages have some um, ability to uh, withstand um, variation. So this is another circuit that was implemented a number of years ago, uh, also very small, consuming 190 nanowatts of power consumption, um, and was able to get a pretty good uh, temperature accuracy, uh, plus or minus 0.21%, and uh, actually quite good um, Allen deviation down to a, a pretty high averaging uh, time. So the architectures we just showed are based on using references. Uh, these are references to generate a good current or a good voltage and so on. Sometimes these are difficult to design at low power, particularly at low supply voltage variation and so on. So one thing that, that uh, we and others had started looking at is can we build a reference-free architecture that avoids this need? So one way to think about this is, is the following. Let's set up some gate leakage transistors uh, these gate leakage transistors will generate some current that will charge up a capacitor. The voltage on that capacitor will charge until it hits some threshold, at which point we will um, stop the charge and it'll uh, do some self-discharge. Okay, This is a circuit that was introduced a number of years ago uh, by, by the team out of the University of Michigan. In this particular case, there's no reference voltage, there's no reference current. It's extraordinarily low power, uh, 120 picowatts was, was this design, uh, but you know, operating at very low frequencies, less than one hertz, we're talking about 70 millihertz here, and wasn't super accurate, although this was a really interesting uh, first, first step uh, to a reference-free oscillator. So if you go back and think about it, the relaxation oscillator is largely determined by a current source charging a capacitor but we need to make that current source be temperature independent and so on. And there's all sorts of other circuits that, that come into play here. So what if we did something a little different? Instead of charging the capacitor through a current source, why don't we just pre-charge the capacitor to you know, some su supply voltage even, or a voltage reference, ideally actually just a supply voltage, and then let it naturally discharge across a resistor. It's easy to make the resistor temperature stable. There's zero power overhead for, you know, designing a resistor. And if we use gate leakage, this can uh, occupy a very small area despite consuming uh, very low current. So we went ahead and built the following oscillator structure. Uh, basically, we pre-charge capacitors and then let them naturally discharge across resistors. And we even use that same chopping technique uh, that we discussed earlier. Um, so let's just step through this uh, step by step to show you how it works. So in step one, we had originally pre-charged uh, capacitor C1P to VDD, and now we've shared charge with C2P, and that has basically, if, if the capacitors were equal, has uh, reduced the charge by a factor, or reduced the voltage by a factor of two. Okay, so then what we do is we uh, take CDN, which was originally charged to VDD in the previous cycle, uh, 
and we let it discharge over resistor RDN. Okay, so that's the purple curve in the plot here, whereas VP is, is that constant curve. Okay, once VN, which now has an exponential discharge, reaches VP, then this will uh, trigger the comparator. And through the feedback, what we'll do is, or, or sorry, rather during this process, we are pre-charging CDP and C1N uh, to VDD. Okay. And then in the next phase of the clock, we basically do the opposite thing. We share charge between C1N and C2N. We allow CDP to discharge over RDP, and we wait until that uh, de exponentially decaying voltage hits uh, the reference voltage established at C2N. Okay, um, so in this way, we're basically chopping the uh, inputs of this comparator so that we can reduce the impact of its offset voltage. And of course, at the same time, we'll pre-charge uh, those other capacitors so that we can start the next cycle uh, again. So the benefits of this architecture is that we don't need to generate uh, any explicit reference voltages or currents. Uh, we can directly use the supply voltage. And in fact, if you look at the uh, equations to first order, there's no supply dependence, right? Because VDD is common to all of the branches. Uh, and as a result, even if there is VDD variation, nothing within the branches should change. We're also benefiting from this chopping approach. Uh, we have less impact on the comparator offset, um, but we do have an exponential decay instead of a linear delay. So that does limit the benefit of, of chopping um, compared to what would happen if we had a linear ramp instead of an exponential decay. So we went ahead and built this structure um, in two different process technologies. One was in a 65 nanometer process using gate leakage to get to very low oscillation frequencies. Uh, we're talking about you know single digit Hertz, but at single digit Hertz, we're, uh, we're consuming 50 picowatts of power. So this is extraordinarily low power. Uh, and we also built a higher frequency prototype using a proper resistor. This was in 250 nanometer uh, CMOS. Uh, in this case, the um, frequency was in the kilohertz range. As a result, its power consumption was, of course, much higher. Uh, but the temperature accuracy was, uh, you know, not not too bad. Not um, state of the art, but much lower power than at least at the time uh, state of the art was. So this uh, lecture very briefly summarized how to build voltage, current, reference generators, and oscillators. There's other blocks that you might be interested in doing. We don't have time to talk about them today. And there's a whole lot of research going on in this space talking about oscillators. Um, reference generators and so on. And in fact, if you're building these temperature sensitive or temperature independent elements, the next logical step is, hey, you know what? You could probably create a temperature sensor as well. Um, and that is indeed something that uh, is still active in, in the research community, including uh, some of the research going on in my own group. Okay, thank you very much.